Well, good morning, friends. If you're still having a chin wag, I'm, I'm glad you're having a lovely socially distanced chin wag. My name's Josh. It's lovely to have you here. Join us for church this morning. Welcome back. A special welcome if you're new or you're visiting. It's lovely to have you here at church. The Bible makes its way into lots of pop culture, doesn't it? There's lots of sayings that we say in all sorts of contexts that come from the Bible. An eye for an eye, the writing on the wall from Daniel, uh, blessed are the cheesemakers, or any, blessed are any uh, manufacturer of dairy products. Uh, that one from Monty Python is a bit of a favorite, and that is talking about the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is our new Bible talk series that we're kicking off uh, this morning. So, you picked a good time to join us because we're right at the start of a new program. Let me begin our time together uh, with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks that we can gather as your people. Thank you that we have heaters in the cold when it's raining. Uh, thank you for all your good gifts. And we just ask this morning as we open your word, you might teach us, you might grow us, and you might conform us to the image of Jesus. Lord, we just ask that you fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, there's a few changes to our kids' program. I'll let you know about those um, as the morning progresses, but I believe our kids' spot is coming virtually, so turn your eyes to the screen. Is that Jax? He said the other week he was going to dye his hair, but I didn't think he would actually do it. He even said he was going to read and read and read and become really smart, but I didn't think he would. Do you really think that could be Jax? I'm Jack? not Jax. Uh, well, when, where's Jax then? Down the bush. In the bush? What's he doing there? Exerting independence. Independence? What are you talking about? What was he exerting independence about? Climbing. You're not being very helpful. Let's start again. I'm Annalise and I'm looking for Jats. I'm Milo, Jats's cousin. We went for a bushwalk this morning. That sounds very nice. Mosquitoes, leeches, bullets. Uh, uh, maybe not so nice. No. So did Jats get lost? No, he wanted to climb the rock. Oh, but you didn't. Well, there was a girl there who lifted me up to the top and I came home. But not Jax. Oh, she offered, but Jax wanted to climb up independently. Hmm, that might not have been a very good idea. No, but he wanted me to see that he was strong and tough. And how did that go? First, he tried his expert, bare-handed rock climbing. And? It didn't work. Hmm. Did he try anything else? 
jumping, unsuccessful, pole vaulting, unsuccessful. Then did he get help? No. He tried to launch himself from the Lambertius. Uh, the what? Lambertia Formosa, mountain devils. The, the mountain what? <sighs> he tried climbing the prickly shrubby trees and launching himself across. Did it work? Is he here? Uh... He did fill up with prickles. I told him to let the girl help him. Ah, oh, yes. The girl. Did he? Well, when I left, he was muttering about making a kite. So, Milo, what you're saying is that Jack's couldn't find a way onto that rock by himself. But there was someone right there who could help him if he would just let her. Correct. Ah, right. That sounds a bit familiar. It's just like us and Jesus. <gasps> You're the one who talks theology with Jats. Well, I think there's a few of us, Milo. But yes, we talked to Jads about what we learn at church. So keep going. I'm listening. Well, people naturally try really hard to get rid of our sin and be friends with God on our own. Just like Jads was trying hard to climb the rock on his own. But there's nothing at all that we can do to help to save ourselves from sin. Just like Jads couldn't climb the rock himself. And believe me, I was there. It was impossible to climb for a fuzzball with only eight fingers and no bones. But are you sure there is nothing we can do about it? Maybe if I can work really hard not to sin, God will forget about it. No, Milo. It's really just like you and Jax on that rock. There was no way you could get up by yourselves. You said yes to the person who could help you, but Jats didn't. Jesus is the only one who can save us from our sins and help us to be friends with God again. Jesus is the only way. There's nothing I can do? Nothing. Zilch. Nada. Only Jesus can save and we need to trust him. Hmm. Uh, what are you doing, Milo? I'm going to exhort Jats to cease his strong-spirited stubbornness and trust the one who can come to his rescue. Good idea, Milo. Good idea. Well, friends, um, just give me a moment to orient you to where all of our different kids things are happening as um, the term has kicked off and all of our kids I think they've all made it um, to their appropriate programs but we do have our choir room at the back here that can take five adults and the appropriate amount of children that need caring for um, we have the unisex bathrooms with all the change tables and those sorts of things um, if you are or have a school age kid they've actually started their program across the road in the Glenbrook infant school um, and so that's uh, where they're going to sign in and where they'll need to be picked up from as well. And if you're a teenager in year seven or eight, Phoebe and Glenn are waiting in the foyer and you guys are going to head off to Crossfire. Um, so that's what's happening with our young people. Let me tell you a few things that are happening uh, in the life of our church, a few ministry matters. Uh, firstly, if you are and you are visiting, we can't write on the communication card, so you can't tell us you came that way, but you can scan the QR code with any smartphone. Um, so be sure to scan that and let us know that you've joined us so we can say hello uh, in some capacity. Um, a couple things that are coming. Next week, we have More College Sunday. More College is the training college for Anglican ministers. They're a mission partner with us here 
uh, we support the work they do. One of their faculty, uh, Mark Erngi, he's going to come and he's going to preach here at Glenbrook and online, and he's going to help us see how we can better partner with them uh, so that many people might be equipped um, to share the good news of Jesus. And an announcement for the women, not the men, the Women's Prayer and Reflection Day is coming the 8th of August, uh, 9.30 here at our Glenbrook location. And that's just assuming there's no further changes to the COVID restrictions and the, the ladies have planned all the appropriate COVID safe stuff. Um, so that's all lined up. And lastly, if you do support the work of our church here, thank you. Um, our ministry can only happen uh, through the generosity of our church family. So thank you for that. Um, you can keep giving online, even though we don't want to be handling cash through the boxes. But now we're going to have our Bible readings. Des is going to come up and read from Ecclesiastes 11 and then Jenny from Matthew chapter 5. So we're reading uh, from Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and we're reading the whole chapter. And by way of introduction, I've always been amazed at the way God instructed the older people, the older generations before Jesus to live. And if you listen carefully as I read Ecclesiastes 11, you'll hear the Old Testament idea of how the subsistence farmers of the day needed to care for the land and look after their own lives. And then later on, we'll be looking at Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus tells us, not only those things, but how we should care for our fellow man and practice our lives. So, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1. Cast your bread upon the waters, for after many days you will find it again. Give portions to seven, yes, to eight, for you do not know what disaster may come upon the land. If the clouds are full of water, they pour rain upon the earth. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where it falls, there it will lie. Whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. Sow your seed in the morning and in the evening let not your hands be idle. For you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. Light is sweet, and it pleases the eyes to see the sun. However many years a man may live, let him enjoy them all, but let him remember the days of darkness, for they, they will be many. Everything to come is meaningless. Be happy, young man. While you are young and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth, follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see, but know that for all these things God will bring you to judgment. So then, banish the anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body, for youth and vigour are meaningless. This is the word of God. Good morning, everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm Jenny Monday, and I'm married to Lewis, and we run a growth group together on a Thursday night, and I'm also involved in the prayer ministry team. We're reading from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. I love the positive language in this passage. It's not, you might be filled with, uh, you might be shown mercy, it's you will be shown mercy. You will be called children of God. You will be comforted. Let me just pray before we read. Father God, we do thank you for the gift of your living word. We just pray that you can grow and strengthen us through the reading of it and the teaching of it this morning. Amen. Now when Jesus saw the crowds... He went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Thanks, Jenny. Hello, everyone. Good to see you, and welcome to those online. Great to have you with us. Uh, it's uh, great to be able to look at a, a terrific series like this, I hope, uh, and uh, let me pray as we come to look at God's Word. Dear Lord and Father, you have given us a brain to think, ears to listen, eyes to read, so shape us as we come to your Word, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm a little bit of a window shopper. I don't know if you're a bit of a window shopper. Uh, I quite like window shopping. That doesn't mean I have to buy anything, but I like going around and being able to look at uh, different uh, things and see what's on offer. My favourite place to window shop is a bookshop. Some of you are thinking, what a nerd. <laughs> um, uh, and you know, when you walk through a bookshop, uh, you've got all of those different sections. Uh, I always like that section that is sometimes called relationships, Sometimes it's called self-improvement, uh, sometimes it's called leadership, uh, but usually it's that section where you have all of the self-help types of books. I was walking through one a few weeks ago and I saw a book called Best Self, Be You, Only Better. <laughs> and I thought, there must be a website out there for the titles of books uh, of things that you want to inspire people with. You know, 101 things you must do to make yourself better. Number one, read this book. Uh, or um, uh, how to be your best self and then be even better. Uh, you know, those types of books that are out there. Now, I don't know, I, I, th there's a place for them. There is a place for them. And I must admit, I have read a few of them along the way. So I know there is a place for them. But my, I don't know about you, but, but, but my feeling when I get to the end of reading one of these books is often a feeling of, I just don't think I'm up to that, or I'm just not the person that you want me to be. Well, we go to the Sermon on the Mount today. This is a fantastic sermon where Jesus takes his disciples and he tries to show them something that will help them in the way that they improve their life, so to speak. And I wonder if there are a few people that would read through the Sermon on the Mount, and maybe you have, or my, I certainly have in the past, where I've read through the Sermon on the Mount and got to the end of it and I thought, I'm just not sure I'm up to that. I'm just not sure I can, I can live up to the standards that are being asked of me in this sermon. Well, I hope that we can look at this and think, well, there is something that Jesus has to say to us, and he says it in a way that allows us to recognise that we can lean on him in the way that we understand what he's asking of us. It would be very helpful if you have your Bible open. So if you're at home, you've got your tablet, your Bible, um, ready to go. If you're here, I know that we can't give you out Bibles, but please have them around. That would be helpful uh, to have in front of you. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew introduces the person of Jesus as the infant born in a stable, coming in a long line of kings as one who's spoken about over the generations. And with such fanfare, and uh, as he's introduced in the beginning of this Gospel, we think great things are going to happen. And then we hear nothing for 30 years. Until, standing in the Jordan River, the heavens open and a voice cries out across, across wherever that says, this is my son whom I love and with whom I'm, I'm well pleased. What a moment to be able to hear those words come across the, across the clouds 
and to point to somebody who is standing knee-deep in, in the Jordan River, about to be baptised by his cousin John the Baptist. That is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And in the space of just one chapter, Jesus moves from the desert and into the towns, such that he goes from a relative unknown to someone that hordes and hordes and hordes of people are following and, uh, and trying to listen to. He begins to preach, he calls his first disciples, he heals every disease, and as the news about him spreads, uh, wow, he becomes famous. So, what does Jesus do? He goes up onto a mountainside and sits down and teaches his disciples. What comes next is what we have as the Sermon of the Mount, the longest continuous block of teaching of Jesus as recorded in the Gospels for us. And as we read in this particular sermon, uh, the Sermon of the Mount, you will see that it really is a template for Christian discipleship. As we look at this sermon, I hope that we'll be able to listen to what Jesus wants of those that He calls to follow Him. That means that if you're a person who is willing to call yourself Christian, and I know there are many watching, there are many here that are happy to claim that title, then you have here, in many ways, a manual that will help us apply what we believe into our life. That is, it also means, though, if you're watching this, or if you're sitting here and you're thinking, I just want to check this Jesus out then you have an open document for you to examine. It's recorded so that anyone can read it. Anyone can then work out for themselves whether Jesus is worth following and whether living your life the way Jesus suggests is going to be beneficial for you or not. We'll start with the Beatitudes. It's an interesting way to start a sermon. Jesus starts off, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. And he lists off with each of those a series of statements. Now, before we, we go line by line through those, which we'll do very, very quickly, it will be, might be helpful to, set, to give you four points of context. First, structure is really, really helpful. That's why it's helpful to have it open in front of you. You'll see it as we examine the words that are there. Uh, when you look at the Beatitudes, you will see that there's a fairly clear pattern. Blessed are those who, and then are listed, eight spiritual states. Those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek, and on it goes. And then with each spiritual state comes a kingdom privilege. So, blessed are, spiritual state, kingdom privilege. Uh, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They will be comforted, they will inherit the earth, and so on. This kingdom privilege may be experienced at the times like the here and the now. Or it could be that that kingdom experience is only going to be something they experience in the, in the there and the then, into, into eternity, uh, perhaps into the heavens that are promised in this passage. Uh, this structure helps us to understand what Jesus is saying, and I hope that that structure will become clearer as we go through today. Second, the title Beatitude is Latin for happiness, but please don't be fooled by that. While happiness might be the experience uh, that a person who has this spiritual state uh, enjoys, it's not the purpose of what you have here. Uh, we would read these Beatitudes wrong by reducing them to the value of happiness. You know, imagine someone saying to you, happy are those who mourn. Happy are those who are persecuted. Really? Sounds a bit trite, doesn't it? At best, it sounds like nothing in touch with reality in any way at all. So, given we, uh, th that we live today in a world that values happiness, you know, how often has someone said to you, I just want to be happy, or I just want you to be happy? We live in a world that values happiness, we would do ourselves a disservice if we look at these Beatitudes as a formula for happiness. You know, happiness will be if I'm poor in spirit. Happiness will be if I mourn. Happiness will be. We'll, we'll do ourselves a disservice to, look, to read it that way. A better way would be think about the blessed person as one who is approved, 
one who is highly thought of. Highly thought of is the person who is meek. Highly, per, uh, highly thought of are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Is that kind of thing. Third, there are no commands here. Jesus is not saying, do this and you will gain that. And we often think about life in terms of cause and effect. That's not what this is doing. If I do this, I will get that. That's not what the Beatitudes are doing. If we read the Beatitudes as a set of commands, then what we do is we reduce them to a set of moral instructions. I must be poor in spirit so that I will gain the kingdom of heaven. I must be merciful so I will be shown mercy. That's not the way to read the Beatitudes. What the Beatitudes do do is provide the believer with a sort of litmus test. You know what that is. Uh, In in chemistry, when you uh, take the litmus piece of litmus paper and you stick it into the formula solution in whatever way, what you are testing is whether it is acidic or whether it is basic, whether it's pure. You just want to see the difference between those two things, and and it tests it out for you. The Beatitudes provide the Christian person with a litmus test to examine their life, so to speak. It highlights those basic spiritual qualities that should exist in a person who is pleasing to God. These are not commands. They are describing a spiritual state, which brings me to the last point. The Beatitudes paint a portrait for the Christian disciple. When we read each of these, we should read them collectively. These are talking about the blessed Christian person. Don't break them up into individual acts of merit. You know, think about that portrait that you look at. Someone paints a wonderful masterpiece, um, a portrait of something that you can recognize and, and think that is just amazing. But you don't just look at their eyes, do you? You don't just look at at, at what they're wearing or how they're painted. That may be stunning and it may be helpful, but that's not not the only thing you look at in the portrait. You look at the whole thing and, and together it becomes beautiful in all sorts of ways and has lots of levels of significance for you. When you read the Beatitudes, you are looking at a portrait of a Christian person. If Jesus was standing at assembly and saying, Uh, uh, you don't want him to be standing as if he's handing out merit awards uh, and uh, and commending people along the way for their individual sort of achievements. Um, This week's merit award for Peacemaker goes to the disciple Peter. Congratulations, you can now be called child of God. And the next award goes to those who are meek. That goes to your brother Andrew for having to put up with you, Peter for getting all of the attention all of the time, and Andrew, you'll inherit the earth. That's not the idea of the way the Beatitudes sort of work. They describe a Christian attitude. The attitude. Qualities that are present in one person who has faith. And so as we look at each individually, remember that they exist together. Okay, are you with me enough to be able to go now through these very, very quickly? Yes, I'm looking for some type of impact. I don't, I don't get this when we're talking to a screen. This is great. All right, that's good. Uh, let's quickly go through. One, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Note that it's poor in spirit, uh, not poor as in materially, I don't have any funds to give, it's not a financial statement here. Uh, this is talking about the spiritual state when a person recognises that they are spiritually bankrupt, that they have nothing that they can offer, that they can give, that will give them any credit before God. To be contrite and absolutely dependent upon God is to be poor in spirit. Yet notice that with this quality comes the privilege of experiencing the kingdom of heaven. doesn't sound very poor, does it? Those who are poor in spirit have that wonderful blessing of experiencing the kingdom of heaven. Two, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. To mourn is a great sadness. When we lose someone we love, when we lose something we love, we cherish it, and because we cherish it, we feel that loss, sometimes right to the heart, and, and our heart longs to feel some type of comfort or healing. 
the mourning here in this particular context is to mourn sin. It is the loss of innocence, the absence of righteousness, the sadness of all that has fallen either in yourself or perhaps not just in yourself, but in the world around, in those that you see, in those that you interact with. It is, it is the fallenness of sin. It's to mourn sin. The inability to do anything about it, to address or to atone for that sin. And with this quality comes the privilege of being thankfully, comforted. Hopefully that will make a little bit more sense as we move our way through the rest of these Beatitudes, because you'll see that in that broader context. Three, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Uh, To be meek is to have a true view of yourself, to not regard yourself more highly than another, that humble, gentle, sensitive, patient desire to see the interests of theirs put before your own. It is to reject the notion that you are the centre of the universe and to recognise that we all sit, every one of us, under the authority of God. And this quality, ironically, comes with the, well, with the reminder that being under God does not mean that you lose the world, you'll inherit the world. Four, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Hunger and thirst in themselves is not the focus of this beatitude. Here, the hunger and thirst, this passion, this desire is for righteousness. If there, is a, uh, if there was a moral encouragement here, it is to, to desire to please God in the way that we live our lives, to be declared righteous because it, because it is conforming to the will of God. And this quality comes, with this quality comes that privilege of being filled with righteousness. Something that can be given but not achieved. Now, let me pause just for a moment here, if you don't mind, and I want you to notice something. These four Beatitudes, are, uh, they are that litmus test for the believer's attitude toward God. And there's a logical spiritual, spiritual progression that moves through these. To be poor in spirit is to recognise your total dependence upon God. And to recognise your total dependence on God God will mean that you mourn over your sin and over the sin that you see around you. And and if you were to mourn over that sin and the sin around you, you'll see that in many ways that is humbling, you will be humbled. So, So in that sense, you're meek and in that state, you hunger and thirst for an answer, an answer for what will be right, to give yourself to God, to give to His will rather than your own. There's a logical spiritual progression. But as you move into the next four, here the focus shifts from an attitude towards God to an attitude towards others. So let's look at them. Five, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. This is to have compassion for those who are in need. A mercy is the loving response offered to those who need it most. The mark of a forgiven person is a willingness to forgive. And you know when this is the hardest, don't you? It's always harder to forgive when you are feeling hurt or damaged by the very one you are called to give mercy to. Yet, if God has shown you mercy, then mercy is what you should show in return. And this quality shows those who offer mercy that they will also be those who receive it. Six, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, if you are someone who fell into the trap of looking at the Beatitudes as a checklist of behaviours, 
that you, you know, have to exhibit in order to earn your place into the kingdom of heaven, then this beatitude puts that delusion in its place. To be pure in heart is to be free of falsehood of any kind. It's to be totally transparent before God and before others. And if that were you, then as one who is pure in heart, then you would be able to see God face to face, as only the pure can. And that's, of course, what the blessing is that's promised here. Now, I realise that leaves us with a few questions. Uh, give me a moment and I'll cover those in the, as we go through the rest of the Beatitudes. Um, let me come back to that. Seven. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. The peacemaker doesn't think, seek conflict. They strive for peace with others. The goal here is reconciliation, to lessen the tension, to offer solutions, to avoid being the troublemaker. The troublemaker, of course, in the New Testament is the devil. Don't be like that troublemaker. And that is different to avoiding conflict. Uh, the, the Christian example here of, of what it means to be a peacemaker doesn't mean that at all costs you just avoid getting into any form of conflict or, or friction in, in any form at all. That's not what this is saying. Understanding the principle behind any potential conflict will mean that you have to stand firm at times in your position. And that may be in opposition. Any attitude which the disciples will be called upon to display as they go on to fulfill Jesus' commission will mean that they have to stand firm on the principles, stand firm in their position. That will generate conflict as they try and share the gospel. And yet as they do that, they need to do it in a way that is constantly seeking for ways to reconcile and bringing that peace that comes with being a peacemaker. And with this, they will be called the children, or more, more accurately, they will be called the sons of God. They will live in such a way that the other will see who they graciously, yet still firmly, stand for. And eight... Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not all reconciliation attempts go well. The result may be, indeed, that persecution or pressure comes. Uh, Jesus will go on and prepare his disciples for the insults that will come, with the false accusations that they will then have to weather for being one of his disciples. And you'll note that this persecution does not come because of their error. It's not as if they've done something wrong and now they're being persecuted or blamed for it. It comes because, well, you can see, it comes because of righteousness. Incidentally, look at the structure. First four Beatitudes finishes with a, a, the, the reason behind them, all for righteousness. The next four Beatitudes, the ones for those that we care as we act towards others, they finish with a call to righteousness. And this privilege comes with the, rem with the reminder that they will belong in the kingdom of heaven. At the, look again at the structure, the very first Beatitude. What do you inherit? The kingdom of heaven. And this last Beatitude, this eighth beatitude, what do you inherit? The kingdom of heaven. It, it bookends the way that Jesus teaches them the beatitudes. And so if the first four beatitudes focus on the attitude that the Christian person should have towards God, this second set of four focuses on the attitude that the Christian person should have towards others. All in the context of the kingdom of heaven. Now, 
Of course, if you've read through your Bible and you've read through parts of what's going on here, you'll recognise that that should not be a surprise at all. Because if you go back into chapter 4 and you look at what it is that Jesus has started to teach, from the very words he formally says in ministry, the very first words he formally says in ministry, verse 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. He is calling it right up front to recognise the kingdom of heaven is there for them. What is important for them to recognize is that kingdom of heaven comes as they understand what it means to repent, to be ready for the kingdom of heaven. A little bit later, after he's called the disciples, still in that chapter, you can see that he goes through synagogue to synagogue proclaiming the good news about the kingdom. Jesus is here to announce the kingdom and he wants people to know how that's going to come about. Now, friends, how do you feel? How do you feel now that we've sort of ruckled our way through them? We probably, you know, there's so much more that could be said on all of those. Have you got to the end of these sort of eight here particularly and think, oh, we've just read another self-help book and I'm sort of feeling like the end of it, this isn't isn't me, I, I, I just cannot live up to what Jesus is asking. Personally, I feel like a bit of a failure reading these. I'm not sure that there is a single beatitude that I could say that I lived up to, least of all the call to be pure of heart. And I wonder if the disciples who were sitting there are thinking to themselves, who have we joined up with? You you know, there'd be a great temptation, temptation to think, I think what he's asking of us is just beyond where I am at. Maybe this was a mistake to come and sit down with this guy. So before we throw in the towel, let me point out that there is only one who lives perfectly the way these Beatitudes have described. And that's Jesus himself. How, how amazing is it that, that we have this sermon at the beginning of his ministry when all he says could be tested back to this incredible standard? You know, I can understand it if you get to the end of your sort of ministry life or the end of your maybe political life if you think Jesus is running a political movement and at that point you then give up your sort of summary speech and say, here is, here is my, my reflection back on everything that I think is important, and everything that I have fought for, and can you see how I've been a, an agent of change, and I've stood for that over all of these many, many years. That's not what Jesus is doing. Right at the very beginning of his ministry, before he could be tested according to any of them, he sets out a standard that is just up here so that we can hold him accountable to that if we were the ones who are supposed to do that. And what we see as we read through the pages of Matthew's Gospel is that he does just that. He shows his disciples what it means to be poor in spirit, to mourn over sin, to meekly give himself to his Father's will, not my will but yours to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to show mercy, to be pure of heart, to be a peacemaker, even when he's persecuted. Jesus is the person of the Beatitudes. And the reason why he tells this to his disciples is not so that they would think that they could achieve all that he is asking of them by their own merit, but because he wants them to know that he will do that for him. He will do that for them. It is by His righteousness that they will know the privileges of the kingdom of heaven. And so in verse 11, He changes His voice. And you can see that there because He said, Blessed are those, blessed are those, blessed are those, blessed are those. But in verse 11 most probably unpacking the last point that he's made, he says, blessed are you. Blessed are you, disciples. 
when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. The first four is all about what it means to be righteous before God. The next four are about what it is to be righteous before the world. And now we recognise that that righteousness, if it's achieved in Jesus, is open to anyone who is with him. But as the disciples are going to discover, that means that at times they'll be insulted, at times they will be persecuted, at times false things will be said about them. And why? Because of Jesus. So what's the application for us today? What's our take-home message this week? What do we do this week to make this work in our life as if we could read a self-help manual and go, Haha, here you go, this is what I'm going to be working on? Well, let me just give you three. First, seek Jesus not for beatitude. He's not asking us to go down this list and go, okay, how am I going on poor, to, poor in spirit today? Do I get a six out of ten? Can I push that up a bit? How am I going on, on uh, being merciful this week? Maybe I'm only a two. I've really got to work on this one this, one, this week ahead. He's not doing that at all. To do that would be to serve the beatitude, not to serve the person of the beatitudes. Seek Jesus. If you want to know how to achieve this checklist, if that was so humanly possible, it is to seek Jesus. As you do, as you follow His will and His Word, as you live under Him, then you'll recognise that those things are things that will become your spiritual state, your characteristic. But that's because Jesus has made that possible. Second, each of these, in the context of how Jesus is saying them, calls us to repent to turn away from a world that maybe wouldn't value those things to the same degree and to turn to Jesus or turn to God. And what you will see as you go through the rest of this sermon is that there is a contrast between the way that the world wants you to live and the way Jesus says, this will help you in the way that you live. That contrast will be on display the whole way through the sermon. So, in a couple of moments, we've got a confession. That's a way of repenting. Not because we're, you know, we want to slap one another over the back of the hand for saying you haven't done well. But because we want to stand before God in Jesus and say sorry. Seek Jesus. Repent. And last, well, actually, he tells you, verse 12. Repent. No, Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Rejoice and be glad because there's a reward in heaven and that reward is being with Jesus. And so what you might experience now well, that may, may be exactly what Jesus has experienced. It'll be what the prophets experienced. It will be what the disciples will go on and experience. It's what we'll experience. But rejoice and be glad. Because this isn't where it stops. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Thanks, Ken. Friends, uh, we can't sing together, uh, but we can be encouraged by the words of this song, This Life I Live. Um, so I don't know about you, but sitting on the plastic chairs tends to um, fade the glutes. So let's stand together and not 
Um, not sing out loud, do stand. Let's um, be encouraged by the words of this song, um, stretch your legs and maybe take a moment to um, even say to the person next to you a thing that stood out um, from these first few verses um, from Matthew chapter 5. Have your seat. It was lovely to hear some COVID safe humming as we express some unity in that song. Uh, friends, we're going to say uh, a confession together now, uh, and this isn't um, because we failed to meet the standards so that we try harder next week, but our confessions remind us that even though we fail, God is faithful uh, and forgives us. Uh, we see that in 1 John 1. So let's uh, pray the words of the confession as it comes up on the screen. Together, Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life. In your mercy, you have washed us from our sins and made us clean in your sight. Yet we still fail to love you as we should and serve you as we ought. Forgive us our sins and renew us by your grace that we may continue to grow as members of Christ in whom alone is our salvation. Amen. Thanks, friends. Uh, Ruth's going to lead us in a time of prayer now. Well, good morning, everybody here and those who are at home as well. Um, that's me, Ruth. Um, we're told in the scriptures to rejoice in the Lord always. 
That is not always easy, especially at the time of this new normal world. Um, having just sung, I'd like to show a Stuart Townend song which encourages me. In every day that dawns, I see the light of your splendor around me. And everywhere I turn, I know the gift of your favor upon me. What can I do but give you glory, Lord? Everything good has come from you. I'm grateful for the air I breathe. I'm so thankful for this life I live, for the mercies that you pour on me and the blessings that meet every need, and the grace that is changing me from a hopeless case to a child that's free, free to give you praise for in everything I know you love me. I know you love me. Father, I thank you for your love for each one of us. I thank you that you love to hear us talking to you. Forgive us when we forget you and try to do things our way. We pray that you will guide the leaders of our world to make wise decisions, particularly during this pandemic. We pray especially for Scott Morrison and all our state leaders. Now, this time we think particularly of Victoria, this traumatic time for many. Give to us all, the people of this land, a spirit of unselfishness, compassion, and fairness in public and private life. We thank you for this Lower Mountains Parish and pray that the witness of our leaders and of ourselves in this community will share by example the light and truth of your gospel and so bring people to know and love you. Um, just particularly like to pray for the churches in Melbourne and our former church, which has um, just discovered they've got COVID-19 in the multi-storied um, housing commission, which overshadows the church. So we pray for the community there and for protection for John the minister and all those in the fellowship who still can't meet in church. And we pray, loving Father, for all those in sorrow, discouragement, loneliness, sickness, as well as fear of the virus. We ask that Jesus will be close to us all and that the Holy Spirit will minister through us. Help, protect, and bless those who care for them and bring us all to know the exquisite joy of your salvation. And I'd just like to mention a few people we've been asked to pray for in this church. Um, young Nathan, Sarah Mundy, Rhonda and Ken and their great grandchild. And then I'd like us all to pray in silence for those we know individually who need your help. Thank you, Father, for all your love and for the confidence we can have in you, that you are responsible, and without you, we can do nothing. To, uh, round off the song. Through all that I have known, I have been held in the shelter of your hand, and as my life unfolds, you are revealing the wisdom of your sovereign plan. There are no shadows in your faithfulness. There are no limits to your love. Thanks, Ruth, for leading us. Friends, this um, draws to a close our formal time gathered here um, in the room, uh, but it doesn't finish our time of fellowship. Uh, there are a couple logistical things that need doing. Um, in just a moment, the welcomers will bring you a wet wipe and you can wipe down your chair and uh, leave it clean for the next person. Uh, if you have moved one of your chairs to be next to someone in your house that you don't need to distance from, if you could put it back to the spot you found it, uh, that's helpful as we reset the room. Mark Hamwood is our, I can't see him now, he might already be cleaning, is our cleaning coordinator, our Captain COVID, and he needs uh, three or four volunteers for a couple small quick jobs. So if you can help with that, um, please see him. Uh, because of the restrictions, again, we can't all mingle and chat in the foyer. We do need to head out our exits 
uh, fairly intentionally, uh, but that doesn't mean fellowship ends, but I might encourage you to have someone over for a tea, a coffee, maybe take someone out uh, to one of the cafes in Glenbrook. Uh, maybe it's an opportunity for you to uh, go home and call someone uh, in our church family who might need to be at home because of uh, health concerns, uh, maybe encourage them with something that stood out to you as we began uh, in Matthew 5 this morning. And so friends, let me uh, finish by encouraging you. The uh, audio Bible app I have puts Matthew 5, 6 and 7 as Jesus' sermon uh, in about 15 and a half, 16 minutes. Um, so as you commute to work, um, as you do whatever you're doing this week, it might be worth listening to Jesus' sermon uh, in one go, in full, maybe a couple goes, and that'll set you up well as we continue. Um, but let me finish our time in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just give you great thanks that you do speak to us, that you speak to us through your word and that you spoke to us through Jesus' sermon that he preached um, these uh, thousands of years ago, and we thank you that you have spoken to us through him. And we just ask that um, from today and as we continue to look through uh, this sermon, you might equip us to live in this world living for Jesus. And we ask that you help us with that, especially this week. Amen. And here come the wet wipes. Jesus, our most humble. 